All right, hello there. We are live um, for our monthly show here. Just making sure you guys can hear me. So please, if you can't, I know last time I was talking for a few minutes and my microphone wasn't turned on. So if you can't hear me, please say something in the comments so that I can fix my microphone. Um, but hopefully we've worked out all our microphone issues. I am Carly Seifert. I am here with our live monthly broadcast that I like to do um, for all music students everywhere, but especially for students that are inside my programs. Busy moms do piano and busy kids do piano. And I am here today um, to discuss adding games to musical learning. So a couple of months ago, I surveyed members that are um, currently using my online programs, and I asked, what do you want me to discuss with you? What would be a topic that you feel you'd like to kind of dig deep on? And they said that it would be adding games to musical learning. And so um, I prepared a packet, and I actually forgot to link it here. I'm going to drop it in the comments that you um, can download. So I just dropped it in the comments. So you can have that packet emailed to you and download it. It is um, a, a game packet, basically. It's three pages long, and I, I think you'll really appreciate having it. And it has specific game ideas that I'm gonna go over with you in greater detail and just kind of explain how I utilize them with my students and with my own kids when we practice. So hopefully there's something that you will find beneficial for you. And before I kind of get into the specific game ideas that I have for you, I want to let you know that I think it's really important to add any kind of playfulness that you can to piano practice, piano learning, any any kind of games that you can add, please do um, for many reasons. One, I always encourage a relational approach to learning to play the piano. And so I find that when my students are um, having that time to kind of play with mom or dad or their grown up, they there is just kind of that support and that bond that happens so i think it's a really good way to encourage that relational approach to learning another reason to include it is because i think it helps with stamina for some students especially if you're working with a young student sitting at a piano bench and working through piano homework can be super involved and super difficult and you're going to meet resistance so if you have games and playful activities that you can add that maybe take you away from the piano bench a little bit but you're still helping your student access that information that's going to be really helpful it's going to reduce frustration your students are not going to be as resistant to practicing they might even look forward to these games if you start to add some into your routine all right, so that's my plug for adding games. And now I want to go um, through some specific ideas with you about some different games that you can add to your practice routine. So the first game I want to talk to you about is adding rhythm games. And if you're a student inside my programs, you know that I am big on using rhythm games. Um, first of all, because I like just focusing on rhythm because when you put a whole piece of music in front of a student at the piano, it can be super overwhelming, right? We have to learn the rhythm, we have to learn dynamics, we have to learn articulation, we have to play the correct notes. So isolating just the rhythm can help a student that gets overwhelmed. And so that's really beneficial. And I also think it's just really fun to isolate the rhythm and play on a rhythm instrument. So if you're inside my programs, I have ways that I encourage you to do this. I have rhythm ensembles and our bonus models, and I also encourage students to use rhythm instruments. So what do I mean by that? I brought some examples. In my piano studio at home, I have drawers full of different rhythm instruments. So I have these um, wooden sticks. <laughs> I have drums, rhythm drums of all shapes and sizes. I have castanets, you can see my castanet here. I'm kind of floppy, but so they can tap a castanet. I have tambourines. Um, so all kinds of rhythm instruments, and my students love doing this. And we'll just, rather than trying a piece at the piano first, we'll just try playing it on our tambourine or playing it on a drum. And, um, or if the student needs to like use their whole body and kind of not be sitting at a piano bench, we might just march or dance in place to the rhythm. So those are some ways to add some playfulness with 
rhythm is just to um, use household items or purchase some simple rhythm instruments that you can keep in your studio and utilize with your student. All right, the next idea that I have, and I've kind of grouped these into two different game ideas. The first group is going to be um, practicing games, like ideas to help your student practice. And then the second is going to actually be to help your student learn and understand different theories and concepts when it comes to music. And feel free, one of the benefits of being live is that you get to ask questions and interact with me and share your own experiences as opposed to me just sharing a pre-recorded video with you. So do feel free to ask questions or share experiences as we go along. Um, but my second idea is to use dice in your playing. And this is something that I actually do with my daughter a lot. Um, so she's in kind of intermediate level type music where a piece is really long and has a lot to it. And so what we do is we isolate small sections that she's having difficulty with. So if she's got two measures that are really tough, like measures four and five, We'll roll the die or the dice, depending on how much stamina I feel like she has for that practice. And whatever it lands on, so if it lands on five, she has to play those two measures five times. Or if you're doing two dice and it's 10, they might have to do it 10 times. Um, so you can have fun with it. And my daughter likes this. It kind of distracts her from her frustration in this piece. And it's always kind of like funny if she gets a one and she only has to do it one time. Or like, oh, if she gets a six and has to do it six times. So we just keep dice by our piano and use those. And if you have a younger student um, with just short, like four measure piece, you can have the student roll the die and they play that whole piece three times or four times or whatever the die lands on. So just some playful playfulness to add there. Um, the next game, let me look at my thing here, technique quarters. So this is kind of an exercise that you can use if your student is not playing with the greatest technique. And what I mean by that is sometimes I have students and they're coming to me after school and they're kind of tired. And so they're drooping with their wrists, like their wrists are down like this at the piano instead of up like this, or they might flatten their fingers. Um, I don't know how well you can see this on the camera. There we go. They might flatten their fingers or they might droop their wrists down because um, they're tired. And so to bring some energy to their playing and to correct their technique, I'll put quarters on their hands and tell them that they have to play an exercise or a little bit of a piece with balancing that quarter on their hand. And that's gonna help them correct their technique. Um, so, right, if their, their wrist is lifted, then the quarter is gonna balance here. If they droop the wrist, quarter is going to slide down. If they flatten their fingers, quarter is going to slide down. So if they keep that round, firm hand shape and the wrist stay lifted on the piano, they'll balance those quarters on their hands. And then I let them keep the quarters when they're done. Um, so that's kind of like their motivation to maintain good technique. And you could always, quarters are a little bit easier to balance because they're bigger. But if you really want a challenge, you could try doing dimes, perhaps not as, as exciting because it's not as much money but um okay next game is simon says and this is i call it simon says it's not really like your traditional simon says um, but that's what i call it and so this is how i do it in my group classes and you don't have to do this much i mean you could just kind of do it off the cuff and name things on the top of your head but um i cut up some papers I'm always going the wrong way with this camera here, some papers and put them in here. And what we'll do is we'll say, okay, we're gonna work on line three today in our lesson. And so you are going to draw something from this bowl. And this one says Mickey Mouse. So you're gonna play line three the way Mickey Mouse would play it. And then they might draw another one and it says, okay, staccato. So you're gonna play the entire piece or line three, whatever you're working on, staccato. And I have all different ones in here. I have Darth Vader, Moana, Slowly, 
Um, so, and that helps them, I think, distracts them from maybe the mundaneness of practicing. Um, and it also helps them think creatively. I think sometimes we focus so much on the technical aspects of playing piano that we don't think about the creative aspects of playing piano. And so your student kind of thinking, oh, what would it sound like if I were to play this piece like Darth Vader um, can be really fun and kind of get them outside of their head a little bit and help them start thinking about expression and dynamics while they're also repeating a section and really learning and practicing a section. And um, if you're a homeschool family and you maybe have characters in history that you're learning about, or if your student goes to school, public school or private school or whatever, and has something they're learning about at school or a book they're reading, it's kind of fun to include those characters as something like play this, this passage like Abraham Lincoln. How do you think Abraham Lincoln would have played the, this passage on the piano? Um, so kind of a fun way to incorporate all different kinds of um, characters and, and fun there. And you don't, like I said, you don't have to have a bowl with these um, cut up and put in here. You can also just say them as they come to your brain. Um, this is just what I like to do. I like to have it a little bit organized um, for my group classes. All right, so those are some ideas for practicing games. Now I'm gonna give you some ideas for actually teaching theory or reviewing theory concepts. So if you've downloaded the packet, and I've shared the link for that packet in the comments, there's gonna be, I just made a little um, board game board, if you will, um, that you can print and just put some game pieces on, use game pieces and dice, or you can certainly make your own, or if you have another um, game board that would work well for this, you can do that as well. And what I like to do with this is just ask students questions about their music. So will, um, you know, each student will take a turn or your student can maybe, if you, there's just two of you, maybe you ask your student a question and then the next turn, your student asks you a question and you might say something like, okay, clap the rhythm in line three or name the notes in measure one or identify the chords in measure six or point to the repeat sign or how many measures are in this piece. I mean, you can ask a crazy amount, any kind of questions about, a piece of music that your student is working on. And then it helps them to really kind of analyze the piece without feeling like they're analyzing the piece because they're rolling the die and are they moving forward or are they moving backwards? And so just a fun way to, um, to kind of review the theory of a piece and analyze a piece without with making it fun. Again, that's what this is all about, making it fun. Um, the next game, this is a really fun one, especially for younger kids that have a hard time sitting still and they need some movement in their practice routine. Um, so you'll need some sidewalk chalk and you'll need it to not be freezing cold outside. <laughs> so this is maybe a game for, for summer. Um, and you're gonna draw a big keyboard on your sidewalk. That they, it's kind of like a hopscotch board, right? So you wanna have the three black keys, the two black keys. Do not write the note names on the keys. Okay, don't write C, D, E, F, G. And you can play with this however you want. If you have a beginning level student, you might have them hop on one foot and say the names of the white keys as they hop down. Or you might have them jump to the group of three black keys or jump to the group of two black keys. So that's a, a really good way to just review keyboard geography with young students. Um, after that, you might get into intervals. You might say, okay, start on C and then hop up a fourth. And then they have to think about, okay, what is up a fourth from C? Or you might have them go down a step or down a skip. So they just start to understand how keys are related to one another through this keyboard geography. Um, you can also help them build chords. So they might, you might say, okay, hop on one foot and build a C chord for me or build a 5-7 chord for me. Um, so lots of ways that you can explore that or half steps, whole steps, all kinds of stuff. So whatever your student is studying, there's um, probably a way that you can use that big keyboard to kind of help and get your students blood flowing, moving, distract them from the fact that they're actually practicing piano and make them just think that they're having fun playing something like hopscotch. Um, and then I had one more, I believe, game. Yes, Lego courts. 
And Legos are actually super great for pianists. Anything fine motor is going to help your student develop fine motor strength. So like handling Legos, pulling these apart and stacking them together, that's really great to develop finger strength. Coloring, really great for developing finger strength. Cutting, all that stuff. So if there's any way you can even incorporate that kind of stuff into your learning, that's fantastic as well. But for Lego cords, um, I always go the wrong way with this camera. Okay, for Lego cords, what I did is I wrote on the side of my Legos, a uh, note name from the musical alphabet. So I did seven here and I just did white keys. But if your student's more advanced, you can always do some sharp signs, you know, F sharp, if you're working in the key of G or some flat signs or whatever. Um, and then you might just break them apart and tell your student, okay, I want you to build a C triad for me, a C major triad. So then your student would have to grab the chords, the notes that make up a C major triad. So C, E, and G and they built the C major triad with Legos. Or you could say, okay, we're gonna do the five, seven chord in C major. So then your student would need to do B, F, where's my G, and G here. And now they've built a five, seven chord. So it helps them to think through what notes make up each chord. And then students think it's fun to play with Legos. And if you're inside my program, I have all these chords spelled out for you inside the theory sheet so you don't have to know what notes actually make up these chords. You'll have a way to, to know what the correct answer is. But that's kind of a fun way for students to practice building chords. And again, you could also do this with intervals. Like you could give them an F and say, okay, what's a fourth up from F? And then they have to think through, okay, what is a fourth up from F? And stack a B on top of it. Um, like this. So it just, again, is helping them to think through relationships with the keys, intervals, patterns, all kinds of good stuff. So those are some specific game strategies that I have for you. Game ideas when it comes to practicing or teaching or reviewing theory. Um, if you're inside my programs, take advantage of some of the bonus modules where we do listening activities or where we do um, rhythm ensembles or even the game section where it's kind of like an app almost where you practice naming notes by racing cars um, and clicking on different things. So whatever you can do to add some playfulness is gonna be super helpful. And um, no one's popped up with any questions. I had Tanya jump in and say she liked the, the dice game. Good idea. Um, if anyone else has any questions or any ideas that have worked really well for them, any playful strategies you've used, any, any games that you have, um, maybe that you invented yourself or games that you've purchased along the way that have been super helpful for your kids, please feel free to share them in the comments. Don't forget to download the game packet. That's gonna have um, all these things that I kind of went and demoed for you. It's just gonna have like a quick summary of them so that you can make sure that you, um, you know, you might forget them when you're not watching this video. And so you can download those and uh, review the games and have that game board with you as well when you're doing theory games. Um, so get that free download. Quick announcement for those of you who are interested or not yet students, but are interested in my online programs, don't forget that next Wednesday, the 20th, we open public enrollment for one week, the 20th through the 27th. Um, besides your program, I do have a question popping up from Kara. What are your favorite learning books for preschoolers? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, okay, I really like Piano Adventures has some early, early ones. Uh, they're called, I think, pre-time, pre-Piano Adventures. They're like letters, like A, B, and C. And those have a lot of games um, and that kind of stuff in them. Um, I also just reading books to your kids about music. And I have lists and resources for that on my blog, but those are fun for preschoolers as well to just read about the orchestra or to listen to a piece of music like the Nutcracker. Um, I have those music camps that I did this summer where we listened to 
um, Carnival of the Animals, and then ask questions about how does this sound like a lion, or do you hear this instrument sounding like the tweeting of birds? Um, so lots of just kind of guided listening can be really helpful for preschoolers just to start to think about music. And then I think um, you don't even necessarily have to have like a specific book or a program. A lot of it is just gonna be you modeling for them and sharing in musical experiences with them. So um, like I kind of mentioned at the beginning, having rhythm instruments, tambourines, um, wooden sticks, blocks, anything like that. Drums are really popular for little ones. And turning on music of all different kinds, so you're exposing them to a variety of styles and then playing along and finding a beat using that rhythm instrument. That's gonna be really fun. Um, music, I have scarves, like those long silky scarves, and we like to just dance around sometimes with the scarves, however the music's making us feel. So I think just exposure and participating in it with your child is really key when they're a preschooler um, and at that young age. Does that answer your question? Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, I don't see any other questions popping up, but if you're watching this after I've been on live, still feel free to ask your questions and I will answer in the comments. Um, I will write down an answer for you. And don't forget that download is here, so you can download this packet of games and use them and Please, if you come up with any others, feel free to share them in the comments as well. Um, Kara asks again, is your program more appropriate for an older child? He's only four. These are great. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, it kind of depends on the student, and that's a question I get a lot. So I don't love to say, like, students should start at age six or should start at age seven, because I think every child's different, and I think that the younger we can get kids started, the better. If you're willing to work with them and be an active part of their learning, I think that absolutely kids as young as four can start. So the skill set that I look for, for before a child begins piano is that um, that student can identify letters A through G, um, hold the pencil. Fine motor is going to be a little bit more frustrating for a younger beginner because it's not going to be quite there yet, so that is gonna take longer to develop, but if they can hold a pencil, then they usually have enough fine motor strength to play the piano, and then be able to count to 10. And um, students that can do those things can usually participate in my program. And I do have a number of four-year-olds. Um, kind of the most popular age I've noticed when students start my program, I have mostly like six to 10 years old. But I definitely have students on either side of that too. I have some lots of four and five year olds and then some teenagers um, and middle schoolers that use the program. With a younger student, um, you are going to need to be really actively involved in their learning because they're gonna need to feel supported. You are gonna have to slow things down a little bit for them. Um, and just understand that you might spend several weeks just working through one lesson. And I mean, this is different for every kid, but that's typically for a typical four-year-old, that's what um, it's gonna be. And then just adding lots of playfulness to it. And actually next month, for next month's masterclass, I'm going to be talking specifically about working with a younger learner. So you'll definitely wanna tune in for that, Kara, um, because I have lots of ideas. I'm really passionate about working with young beginners. I started my own kids really young in piano and I um, have taught many, many young students. So that's a subject that's dear to my heart. <laughs> and um, and I think if your child is four and um, has some interest and has those skills, like I said, can hold the pencil A through G, one through 10, then, um, then you're okay to get started. So um, hopefully that answered your question. And I'll wait for just a minute and see if any other questions are popping up. I'm not seeing any, but as I said, I check on here and I'll get notified if you have questions afterwards. Oh, thank you, Kara. Thanks for joining in and participating and asking questions. I, I hope you um, learned some new things here. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining in. Um, public enrollment opens next week for those of you who are interested in my programs. If you're a student of my program, 
This will be archived in the video masterclass se section, so you can always watch it again at a later date, uh, rather than having to scroll through my Facebook page to find this again. Um, so thanks so much for joining me. I love adding playfulness and games to practice. Oh, thank you, Kate. Thanks for joining in. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye for now.